meeting with Putin, he had said that uh, the relationship between Beijing and Moscow was rock solid and, quote, would withstand any test in a changing international situation. I was curious from the Pentagon standpoint, the concern of this strengthening tie between Russia and China. Well, these are sovereign countries able to make their own sovereign decisions, but um, we have certainly made clear, not just um, from here, but other agencies and, and the White House, um, that there will certainly be consequences for China should they um, deepen their relationship with Russia. Now, we haven't seen them give lethal aid to Russia at this time uh, for the war, but they haven't also taken that off the table. And so um, we have been consistent from here, and I believe Secretary Blinken also met with his counterpart um, in Germany just last week. Um, we reinforced there that, again, there will be consequences for China should this partnership with Russia uh, further deepen. And then any comment mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, Putin saying that they were going to suspend the nuclear arms control deal as well? Well, we certainly think it's unfortunate from, from the department's perspective. We think it's irresponsible. Um, any nuclear power uh, has to behave in a responsible manner, and we certainly take our obligations under, under the New START treaty seriously. And um, as the secretary has said before, we're going to continue to monitor this and continue to fulfill our obligations. Jennifer. Hi, Sabrina. Just to follow up, what steps will you be taking in, in relation to the suspended New START treaty? Are you going to make any changes to your nuclear posture? Um, is there anything concrete that you, that this will, what will this mean in a concrete manner, um, his announcement? Well, nothing, no changes in terms of our, pos our posture. Nothing is changing um, in terms of the obligations that we are set to meet. Um, again, we are and the Secretary believes that a, a responsible nuclear power um, needs to continue to work with other countries around the world that have these nuclear capabilities. And so Russia's withdrawal from the New START Treaty is certainly unfortunate and irresponsible. And what is your reaction to Russia and China having naval exercises with South Africa that started today? Yeah, we've seen, again, these are sovereign nations that engage in um, exercises with other uh, partners and, and countries all around the world. Um, we certainly have our own engagements with other countries, and I'll just leave it at that. So are you disappointed in South Africa for hosting them? I'll just leave it at that. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to follow up on China and Russia's relationship. So Secretary of State Blinken said he's worried about China is considering providing research support to Russia. So does Pentagon has the same assessment and could you give us some evidence of this assessment? We because haven't seen right now uh, the, uh, we haven't seen China provide lethal aid right now at this time. They haven't taken it off the table. Um, as I mentioned before, we've warned China about any um, implications and consequences should they provide uh, material support to Russia. Um, and I think China, as the Secretary and um, Secretary Blinken, I think, also reiterated in his travels, um, China would seriously risk miscalculating its continued support for Russia. This is a war that Russia you know, launched against Ukraine. Um, we're coming to the one-year anniversary just at the end of this week. Um, and it would certainly be a miscalculation of China to, to provide lethal aid to Russia. Warren. Uh, two different questions. An online publication called Dragon Lady Today, I believe, published a photo of a U-2 flying above a, a balloon. Can you confirm that the photo is authentic and will you be releasing it? Uh, and then I'll ask the second question in a second. I, uh, yes, I saw that report. Um, I can confirm the, 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 the photo's authenticity and we are planning to release it and hopefully you'll be getting something in your inbox soon. And then second question, thank you. SOCOM began an investigation into potential issues with its cloud service that may have exposed information. What changes have been made to address the issue and what other commands potentially have the same vulnerability? So I've seen the reports that you're referring to as a matter of practice and for operational security. We just don't comment on the status of our networks and systems. Um, so again, I just, I, I won't go much further than that other, other than to say that we're going to assess these open source reports and um, we'll continue to monitor. And if I have a further update, when I do, I'm happy to provide it. Can you say whether changes were made to, to address 
the vulnerability because SOCOM acknowledged there was an issue. I, I again, I'm seeing the, I, I've seen the reports. Again, it's early right now in its assessment. I just have nothing for you at this time. Sure, right in the back. Oh, Mike, sure, and then I'll come to you. <laughs> or vice versa. Hi, uh, Tony Bertuca, Inside Defense. Yeah. There seems to be a gap between sort of low-tech systems like the balloons and these objects and the very exquisite, very expensive, very manned systems that we're using to take them down. Is the Pentagon wrestling with this gap at all? Is there a different way to get at this security problem? Do we always have to fire a sidewinder? Do we have to look with a U-2? It seems like there's a big space in between a balloon and what we send to go look at it. Well, I think that... Again, this was a balloon, a Chinese spy balloon, that we didn't know its capabilities. We didn't exactly know um, what could happen if we and did shoot it down. So it was the assessment of the NORTHCOM commander, uh, the recommendation of the secretary and the chairman uh, to take it down with a Sidewinder missile. Are there any discussions about how to calibrate this response in the future, about if it's a balloon, if it's an object that could be a commercial object? Well, you saw, uh, I think just last week, the White House announced a ta an interagency task force that is going to be um, uh, pulling together to, to look at different incidences and how to better assess what action should be taken. Um, I don't have more at this time to read out from that. That task force was just announced. But um, when we do, I mean, that's what we're trying to do for the future. We're trying to improve um, not only how we respond to certain incidences, but to ensure that there are no uh, there's no civ civilian casualties or damage or anything like that. And quick as a follow-up, is there a chance we might see a cost for what this was, the cost of flight hours, the cost of the sidewinders, the, the cost of what it took to try to mitigate this problem? I believe we have the cost of some of those aspects, and I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Mike? Hello. Um, does it poppy seed question. Does the uh, concerns about poppy seed also uh, apply to the dreaded lemon poppy seed pound cake in the MRE? And if not, why not? Is, is that your favorite That's snack? Favorite. Okay. Uh, then I, I am sad to say it probably does. Um, we are advising service members when it comes to consuming baked goods, such as the lemon poppy seed cake that you just mentioned, um, that there are there's a potential positive uh, coding uh, test. The one that the Pentagon is providing the troops? We are certainly uh, advising service members um, that they could, we are advising them to not consume those products if they are scheduled for a drug test, um, as they could potentially test positive for coding. Yeah. Yes. Hey, thanks very much. Yeah. What was the last uh, official contact between I'm the sorry, Pentagon? I'm sorry, can you just speak up a little bit? Sure. What was the last official contact between China and the Pentagon? Um, and at what level? Um, I believe, uh, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to take that question. I, I don't remember off the top of my head when the last con official contact was, so I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. Yes, right over here. Tell us, please, uh, Sabrina, what kind of uh, co consequences uh, could China face if they are provide uh, a lethal aid uh, to Russia? And how could that be effect on the conflict there? So I'm not going to get into hypothetical questions of if China does something, then what those consequences are. Um, this administration has been clear both publicly and privately um, to, to the PRC about consequences that they could face, but I'm just not going to broadcast that from here. The effect of the, any consequences? Well, again, that's just getting into a hypothetical that I'm not going to engage on from here. We just, again, have been very clear with our Chinese counterparts that uh, providing any type of lethal aid to Russia, continuing to um, support Russia while this war in Ukraine um, is ongoing is just not something that we support. It's certainly not something that uh, the international community supports when you have um, the broad array of, uh, you know, over 50 countries at the Ukrainian Defense Contact Group supporting Ukraine. So, um, again, I'm not going to forecast anything from here and not going to engage in hypotheticals. Yeah, right here in the front. And I can come back to you, Jen. Oh, um, thank you, Liam and then we're going to go to the gentleman right behind you. <laughs> Sorry, Marty. Thanks, Liam Cosgrove with Epic Times here. Hi. 
Um, two questions I'll just ask. The first, um, kind of with what you mentioned about China and Russia have been meeting and talking about deepening their ties. Yeah. Um, are you concerned at all that us isolating Russia in response to their invasion of Ukraine is pushing them into the arms of China? And at the very minimum, shouldn't we be having a dialogue with Putin, similar to you know JFK did with Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis? So in terms of, let me take the first part of your question. In terms of isolation, Russia's done this to themselves. This is Putin's war. Putin chose to go to war with Ukraine, um, their neighbor, and uh, certainly unjust, unprovoked war. Um, so in terms of isolation, they've done that to themselves. Uh, I think you used, I, I can't remember how you characterize it, but being forced. We should be talking with them. Even, they may have isolated we, themselves. We've certainly maintained the lines of communication. As you just saw, the White House uh, reached out to uh, Russia to um, alert them about the president's visit to Kiev. We maintain open lines of communication. So the, the ICBM test that was just launched over the weekend by Russia, we were notified through the New START Treaty uh, process that they were going to test um, the ICBM. So it's not that we've closed off communication. We welcome communication with Russia. Well, they have asked to speak with Biden without Ukraine's presence, and I know we want to involve Ukraine, but couldn't we go to, to that meeting and speak on Ukraine's behalf maybe without them being there, just to ease the tensions in some way. No, there's nothing, as the president has said, nothing, uh, there's nothing that's going to happen with Ukraine without Ukraine. We're not gonna have uh, singular conversations with Russia about the war in Ukraine. It is Ukraine who is the most impacted, it is Ukraine's uh, civilians who are being killed on, on the battlefield and in cities. Uh, Ukraine has every right to be part of any conversation, uh, whether it's with us in Russia, but we would not have a conversation about the war without Ukraine. But if it helps our citizens, us doing this, wouldn't that be something to entertain? Well, how, we don't know if that would help their citizens. Again, I'm not gonna engage in a hypothetical question. Yeah, I'm, again, I, as the president has said, as the secretary has said before, there is nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. And now for, to the gentleman right behind you, if you don't mind passing him the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, recent presidential drawdown for uh, yep. the uh, recent presidential drawdown for Ukraine inc mm -hmm. included uh, secure tactical communication systems. Are you able to provide any more details about what those include? Are these primarily radios or other systems? And are they intended to provide an alternative to Starlink for the Ukrainians? Again, Starlink is still operating uh, above Ukraine, and um, uh, we've provided SATCOM systems before. I'm not going to get into more specifics on that. Um, I'll just leave it at that. And are these systems that the U.S. hasn't provided before, to you, like these specific systems, or are these just more of the same equipment that DOD has provided in the past? I can take that question and get back to you. Jennifer. Oh, I'm sorry, Jen. I'll come just a quick follow-up. Sure. Would you consider the advanced semiconductor chips that Russia needs for its weapons in Ukraine to be lethal aid if China were to provide those chips to Russia? I don't want to get into characterizing what the lethal aid, what that could look like, because those chips can be used for different things. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at, you know, lethal aid that if, if China were to provide that to Russia, uh, it would... China would certainly face consequences. Great, Jim. Okay. After the um, after the balloon, the, the secretary tried to get in touch with his Chinese counterpart, mm -hmm. and they didn't pick up. Has he tried since then? Is not, he planning to do it uh, any time in the near future? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we 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 welcome um, open lines of communications. We would continue to. Um, again, as you mentioned, the secretary did reach out to his counterpart, but we did not hear, uh, we did not hear anything back, um, but we welcome open lines of communication. Yes, the gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Alex Rahande with Newsweek. A uh, Pentagon spokesperson told USA Today that the M1 Abrams tanks will take several months to arrive in Ukraine. By what specific date uh, can those be expected to appear on the battlefield? I don't have a specific date. Again, these are um, the the Abrams were um, announced through our USAI uh, security assistance. So that is something that's going to take time, and it's going to go out for contracting. Um, so I just don't have a specific date for you at this time. Do you have a rough month estimate? I don't. I don't. Thanks. Yeah, Travis, and I'll come back. 
Thanks. Um, I just had another question about the, the three objects. Sure. Um, we've heard about uh, some of the assets and units that were involved in trying to recover those. Yeah. We've heard about the FBI. I'm wondering about Arrow, the mm -hmm. Pentagon's UAP office. Yeah. Can you say how and if it was involved in any of these efforts to recover those objects? It was my understanding in the legislation there was supposed to be an, a team that would go out to sites and do that type of work. In terms of um, in terms of the teams that went out to sites, in terms of the recovery, I mean, each each one was a bit different, um, and each. I think location had a different lead, so I would just, I would have to take that and get back to you. I just, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take one more. Thank you so much. Uh, Showa Tanabe for Japanese Nippon TV. Uh, on North Korea, uh, they la launched the, uh, their ICBM uh, last weekend and the m uh, multiple missiles also. And also the missile believed to be a solid fuel uh, ICBM was also observed at the military parade uh, this month. Right. So what is current DOD's assessment uh, of the progress uh, of the North Korea's ICBM development? Well, I'd let the North Koreans speak for th their own progress on how they think uh, their program is going. Um, we continue to see these efforts as destabilizing, as unhelpful to the region, um, which you are probably tracking, but just recently we um, led our own um, trilateral defense exercise with uh, Rock and Japan, which I think further um, shows our commitment to the region and to our partners and allies. But um, when it comes to DPRK's continued ballistic missile tests, these are, these are not just not helpful in tr in for the region and continue to be destabilizing. Oh yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding North Korea, Mm -hmm. Have the U.S. and the South Korea conduct a desktop uh, exercise at the Pentagon today to uh, simulate the use of nuclear weapons by North Korea? If so, uh, could you give us some details on who participated and what they did, and also the comments on the exercise? Thank you. Yes, so as you mentioned, the United States and the Republic of Korea conducted the eighth rock deterrent, U.S. rock deterrent strategy uh, tabletop exercise today. Um, I don't have a ton of more information for you right now, um, but we will have more details to share this evening. Okay. I don't have more details right now, but we will have something for you this evening, and when we get that, I'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah. Sure. I'll take, I'll take two more questions, and then we got to wrap. Thanks. Just uh, one more on, on Russia. Can you talk about, um, just on the on Russia's ties, military ties with Iran, when, I don't know if you have it off the top of your head, but when was the last time uh, DOD saw any type of uh, Iranian weapons shipped or received by, uh, by the Russians? And have you all seen any updates, or are there any updates on potential uh, fighter jets being provided the other way around from, from the Russians to the Iranians? Thank you. Sorry, can you repeat the last part of your section? Any fighter jets from who? From from the Russians to the Iranians. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of like date and delivery of uh, um, supplies from Iran to Russia, I just don't I, I don't have specific dates for you on that. We know that Iran has been supplying Russia with whether it's drones or other capabilities um, in this war, and you know that relationship continues to. Um, uh, bear out on the battlefield, um, but I don't have anything more on, on fighter jets. I would refer you to Russia for that. Yeah. Okay, one last question over here. Or maybe you'll have five. Um, thank you. Just You mentioned that China would face consequences if they do provide lethal mm -hmm. aid. Would you be willing to go into what those consequences might look like? No, I mean, again, I don't want to get ahead of and forecast any of those consequences. We have been very clear, both publicly and privately. I think you saw um, Secretary Blinken was just on travel and met with his uh, PRC counterpart in Munich and expressed our um, disappointment if uh, they, if if the PRC did provide lethal aid uh, to Russia. And you know, I'm just not going to get ahead of any of what those consequences might look like. Are there any strategies to? Again, we've been very clear about our uh, our relationship, and we welcome open lines of communication. I know Jim had asked me about that earlier. 
Uh, I think the incentive here is to be on the side of uh, many partners and allies of the United States who are supporting Ukraine. I mean, we're for I think you're forgetting here that this is a sovereign country that invaded another sovereign country, an unprovoked uh, war that was started by Russia. And so um, it is, I think, looking at it from this perspective, uh, it is one side that needs the support and help of the world, and that's why we are standing firm with the Ukrainians. Great. I think I'm going to – do you have something else? Well, I would just say that, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis example, that was very hostile. We were very hostile mm -hmm. towards Russia during that time. They had uh, military bases in Cuba. But what we did was we opened a dialogue. We offered to take our military bases out of Turkey, and then it, it worked. It, it de-escalated the crisis. So you have to – you only make peace with your enemies. You don't – that's who you have to be talking with is – are, are well, uh, let me just make this very clear. We're not at war with Russia. We're not fighting with Russia. We are supporting the Ukrainians in their war that Russia started. So let's just be clear about that. I think it's important to remember that, again, a neighbor of Russia was invaded b by Russia. Ukraine was invaded by Russia. We have been and this administration has been committed to standing with Ukraine for as long as it takes. And that's what we're going to continue to do. Now, I said earlier when you asked me the same question that we're not shutting down any lines of communications with Russia. We, we welcome communication and we, we would maintain, we continue to maintain those lines. Um, but again, nothing is going to happen with Ukraine without Ukraine at the table as well. And so um, I just, would reiterate that the United States stands firm with Ukraine and, again, over 50 partners and allies also supporting Ukraine in this war. All right. Thanks. I'm going to leave it at that.